think you know the shape of our world? Maybe, maybe not. Tonight, we're tackling the enigmatic clutter theory head on. Will your perspective be changed? Stick around and find out. Tonight on Newsworthy, two words and two question marks. scoured the podcast world and finally found us newsworthy with steve and jerry where we delve into all things mysterious macabre or out of this world and decide if they are truly newsworthy two words and two question marks Hello, I'm Ed Locke with USA Mortgage. Tax season is upon us. Did you know that 47% of Americans are planning to use their tax refunds for everyday expenses, home improvements, and vacations? What if you used your tax refund for a new home instead? Again, this is Ed Locke with USA Mortgage. Your tax refund can be used towards down payment, closing costs, or paying down existing debt to help get approved. So before you spend that tax refund, let's get together and see how to best utilize those funds to invest in your future and your new home. Call or text me at 502-680-0953. Again, that's 502-680-0953. NMLS ID 448-908, DAS Acquisitions, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, NMLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is an equal housing lender. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Jerry, I'm gentlemen. stoked tonight. We got a very, 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 very special guest with us. And we do. We have the OG guest. The, the OG we guest. Had. Welcome, Mr. Clay Davis. Hi, gentlemen. Glad to be back with you guys tonight. Thank you for having me back on. Dude, uh, anytime. Open invite for you. Jog, jog my memory. I, I know I know. I was the first guest, but is, is this number three or is this, this number This is number four? three. Okay. I couldn't remember if we were on number three or number four. The first one was uh, we talked something about throwing. Oh, it was uh, uh, we talked. That's back when we did actual news stuff. And we were talking about uh, surveillance State cameras. And, yes. Yeah. Yes. Local and, surveillance. Yeah. Then we went from there to federal. Yeah. Yep. Overreach. Yep. So then, today we talk, talked a little bit about uh, Lieutenant Corso, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Cool, man. And today we're not kicking rocks. We're just trying to, well, <laughs> maybe we are. <laughs> Coming at it from the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. We're trying to learn and understand things tonight. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yes. It's a lie, but it's a good way of putting it. <laughs> um, I don't understand you two, though, for real. Because just because you all don't believe what I believe, it, it hurts my heart a little bit. You believe flat earth? Absolutely. Okay. 100% in. Okay. Not really. <laughs> But that's the that's the way I came at this topic tonight. Oh, that's at, that's at least a fair take on it. At least you were trying to be objective, right? Well, yeah. before we get started, I should probably, in the interest of full disclosure, tell you guys that uh, <coughs> I used to be a flat earther. Ooh. I actually was a flat earther for about four years. Really? Oh, come on now. This is this is a delayed April Fool's joke. No, it's not. I, I was a flat earther. I truly believe the earth was flat for about four years, and then I turned five. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Oh, man. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't have anything with that, but <laughs> I did plow my garden talking about earth. I plowed my garden the other day. Okay. And it, I've been thinking that somebody's been adding dirt to my garden. Really? Yeah, I haven't figured it out yet, but 
the plot has thickened. Oh, oh. Nah, gee. Sure sign. <laughs> Man. Well, that wasn't my dad joke, believe it or not. That was a true story. I actually, like most kids, you know, small children believe what we see. What we see is flat earth, right? So, yeah, I, I really was. My dad joke for the week is uh, a prediction, sort of. Highlighters are going to be making a huge comeback soon. Why? Oh, yeah? Mark what? my words. Oh. Uh. Mark my words. Ah. Uh. That's, good <laughs> That's so bad. Uh. I love that joke. Pretty good. Oh. Man. You know, speaking of that, Jerry. What? The person that made the dry erase board. Okay. That guy's remarkable. <laughs> Yes, I would agree. <laughs> Me too, man. <laughs> oh, come on, jump in here, Clay. You know you got one. Well, you know, in, in typical Clay Davis fashion, in honor of tax day, I've got a tax day dad joke for you guys. Uh, mm. Why Why are taxes like the game of golf? Why? Because you work hard on the green just to end up in the hole. <laughs> that's a true story uh, that was a very mild joke <laughs> when Clay first said he was going to do a tax joke being a libertarian I was like oh no this can't I can only imagine where he's going to this so yeah, I, very mild I used ultimate restraint ultimate <laughs> uh, yes. look at you go <laughs> look at you go so, speaking of tax day, I, I waited until the last minute to do my taxes as per usual, and I had a I had two folders, and I thought I had everything in there, and I get ready, and I'm like, you know, I'll put it off, I'll put it off, put it off, sit down to do my taxes, and cannot find Robin's W-2 <laughs> anywhere. Tear my house apart. I remembered her giving me something. And I stuck it right next to my 1099 from real estate. So I was like, yeah, I got everything. Tear my office apart, my studio apart, my desk apart, everything. Finally, she happens to walk by and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I can't find your damn W-2. And I'm going crazy, just full on panic mode. Because it's like 930 at night on April 15th, okay? There's no recourse now. There's no extensions going to be filed. It's either going to go in or it's going to be late. And she's like, oh, you mean this one? And out of her purse, it comes. I was so mad. I was like, not at her, at myself, because I thought I had it all. What would we do without yeah. our women, man? <sighs> well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What you said. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm I'm stoked for the topic, really. And I tell you what, you know, I often will tease a, a topic on Facebook sometimes, and I'll tease something on Twitter or whatever. Uh this one has by far gotten one of the biggest responses out there that we've ever gotten. And I'm like, what? Yeah, I, I, I was really surprised at how many comments and uh, reactions and just engagement, uh, the little post that you made. Uh, yeah. I was just like, wow, there's uh, there's there's quite a few folks that are uh, at least knowledgeable about the subject, if not all all in true believers. Uh, well, I think that a lot of them are just curious. Yeah. Yes. I think that. Um, a lot of them see, and, and Jerry and I was talking about like YouTube algorithms and, you know, you see one of those videos and you watch it through to its entirety. And then all of a sudden that's all you see. So then you start believing what you're seeing, whether or not it's all hogwash or not. Um, uh, because there's like every conspiracy theory, there's at least a kernel of truth. There's at least a if I bend this this way and say something this way, I can make you feel that way. I think there's a little bit of that. Oh, there's a lot of that. And we'll probably get into that a little bit more. Um, that 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 is a common um, thing that you're going to experience with any broad conspiracy theory that 
is steeped in vagueness. Yeah. Such as this one and others like alien, uh, ancient aliens and uh, ancient astronaut and alien astronaut theory. All of them are specifically vague so that you can make loose connections and tie them to it relatively easily. Uh, Yeah. So. Clay, have you seen any surveys into how many people believe in flat earth? Yeah, I've got some uh, info in some of my uh, research uh, on some of the polling. It's it's pretty interesting. There are actually it is. some some demographic areas that are shockingly high. <laughs> 18 to 24-year-olds, I assume you're talking about? Uh, yeah, and then, uh, well, specifically in Brazil, which may be the epic yep. of, yep. of belief <laughs> in, in the entire world. Uh, fascinating, fascinating. It is. But when we're talking about, you know, how many people believe it, uh, there's a large number that considers it to be at least a possibility. Yes. Far larger than I would have ever dreamed. Yes. Yeah. So I pre- yeah, it, it, people that just aren't sure, that can't definitively say, yes, I believe this or no, that they, they're just not sure. The agnostics yeah. <laughs> of, of flat earthers. Like, <laughs> That's a heck of a yeah. way of putting it. I like it. <laughs> I uh, but I, I have to come clean uh, and admit, guys, that I have some preconceived notions and beliefs about today's topic. And uh, that made this a bit of an arduous task uh, to do show prep for this one. Uh, You see, I didn't want to come out of the gate immediately and be dismissive of flat earth theory uh, and those who subscribe to it. The last thing I want to do as a guest is to alienate, alienate any of your listeners. And I realize there are some folks out there listening right now who are true believers. Uh, so I went into this with as much of an open mind as I could possibly conjure up. And uh, I endeavored to approach this kind of investigatively with a curious heart and a critical mind. Um, the funny thing, though, is I, I discovered something kind of peculiar along the way. As I delved into the mysteries of, of flat, flat Earth theory, I soon found that my interest was, it was shifting, not so much toward what it was from like a nuts and bolts perspective, but more toward what it was exactly that made folks believe in this with such extreme fervency and zeal. It made me consider for just a moment if the recent uptick in this movement might also be reflective of something much bigger going on in society and that is simply an ever growing mistrust in traditional in, in, institutions maybe behind this i mean i i don't know but I, whatever, totally agree. whatever the catalyst of- might be i kind of find found that to be a more interesting question what's actually causing folks to jump on this flat earth bandwagon perhaps tonight uh between the three of us we can sort of figure all that out together guys well i think that um during dinner today, which you're going to come to the studio some, so you can have dinner with me. Yeah, today. man, we'll have to do that. Um, but anyway, during dinner, I think Jerry literally put the nail on the head with that. But we'll we'll save that to the end for what he's for what his theory on that is, because I think more so than anything that I've seen, read, or anything, that nails it. Yeah. Yep. I'll let you think about what that is and, and start guessing. But as bad as I hate to admit this, every once in a while, Jerry gets it right. <laughs> Gosh, oh, I, that just hurts. That hurts so bad to say that. But I do know that Jerry loves when you admit it out loud publicly and he can just come back and throw that in your face. Dude, if you could see the smile on his face right <laughs> now. <laughs> You're <The> boastful. <laughs> You're uh, you're partially right, but what you're not also admitting is that in the past what thirty something years that I've known you, it's happened so many times. <laughs> <sighs> Bother. <laughs> Keep in mind when I true story, and he'll admit this. When I first met Steve, he was one of the most liberal people you would ever meet in your life. 
Now the guy's literally come on 180. He's the, one of the most conservative people I've ever known. They, they, there, there's a belief that people tend to grow more conservative as they get older, but very true. Very true. I believe that's true, and, and I believe that the reasoning is you become nostalgic. You don't want things to change a particular way or that's things to go true. different. Yeah, yeah. And Republicans are resistant to change. That's true. valid. That's. Not what I said, it, but it's but it's true. Yeah, is it not? Of, yeah, they yeah. tend to be whether it's you know morals or or whatever aspect you want to look at. They tend to be le- far less resistant to change. There's a reason why the other side's called progressive. What's the opposite of progressive? Wishing to remain right where you are. Progressively wanting to spend more of my tax dollars. There you go. <laughs> I had to get it out there, Clay. Hey, I'm. I'm- oh. There's blood pooling up in the corners of my mouth. I'm biting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's get back to flat earth. That's yeah, let's 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 do. Of so, Clay, you want to start us off? Well, you guys want to get into kind of some of the nuts and bolts of what what flat earthers believe. I mean, I guess that's probably as good a place to start as any. Huh? Sure, absolutely, <laughs> go for it. So, the the basic premise is they be- believe the world is a flat disk with the Arctic Circle in the center. The continent strewn out amidst the field of the disk and Antarctica forming a 150-foot tall ice wall border around the edge of the disk. There appear to be several variations from this model, but this is the basic premise, give or take a few you know, different nuances. Right. Uh, from interviews conducted with flat earthers, it appears many also subscribe to a vast array of other controversial con- conspiracy theories, such as governmental weather control, chemtrails. Uh, however, interestingly, they all consistently and overwhelmingly believe in one conspiracy theory above all others that the moon landing was fake. Um, yeah, I got a whole list of things that couldn't be the case if flat earth is accurate. So, uh, well, and one of the reasons why I, I, I think they, they think the moon landing is fake aside from a huge distrust in NASA. Um, there's also a belief that there's a, a an invisible firmament, a dome that is actually over this flat earth and that that firmament actually prevents space travel. It prevents us from actually going into the heavens and that it was intentionally set up that way. Um, It would not only prevent that, it would prevent anything from going into space. So satellites, everything that requires going into space, they believe didn't happen. And thus it makes it real easy for them to pretty much put (coughs) poo-poo on anything NASA does. Now on the NASA thing, whether you believe NASA, whether you trust NASA, this is much <laughs> the flat earthers mistrust in NASA is not necessarily misguided in my own opinion. And it's very similar to kind of what we all agreed with, with the UFO conspiracy theory. There's so much mistrust because the damn government lied about it so many times. <laughs> Right. There there are some things that NASA fudged, whether we went to the whether you believe we went to the moon or not, there are some things that you can that people have made pretty definitive cases for that were faked. Um and, and some of that is just maybe because there was such a an excitement over the moon trip that they they were trying to get everything they could to kind of satisfy the the public's hunger so maybe some photos that were maybe taken during practice during you know some of some of some of the stuff leading up to may have gotten snuck in and passed off i don't know but nasa's done some things in their past that have maybe made it easier for people to mistrust them i'll i'll just leave that where it's hanging um but pictures from space showing the spherical earth uh they definitely are considered to be an elaborate hoax by flat earthers. Um, and that's whether they've been taken by space stations, satellites, anything that NASA puts out from space is immediately dismissed by flat earthers. Um, earth's gravity is believed to be an illusion. 
Objects do not accelerate downward. Instead, the Earth disk accelerates upward at 32 feet per second squared, <laughs> driven up by a mysterious force called dark energy. <laughs> so, um, they also believe the sun and moon are oriented much closer to Earth than we are told. And they also believe that they're much smaller in size, measuring only 32 miles each. When I think... Jerry, do you know for sure? But isn't the sun like sixty-seven million miles? Uh, Ninety-three. Ninety-three. Uh, Ninety-three million I, miles. I knew it was some astronomical number, but um, but we're dealing in in the, with this theory um, with thirty-two miles each <laughs> on the moon and the sun. So uh, again, it, the Earth is protected by an <clears throat> invisible dome, as we mentioned earlier. Um, this was to keep the waters of heaven out and theoretically to keep us in, making space travel impossible. Um, flat Earth theorists also tend to follow a mode of thought uh, that if, this is kind of interesting. Um, it's called the Zetetic Method. It's an alternative to the scientific method. And of course, it was developed by a flat earther in the 19th century um, in which sensory observations are the dominant means by which data is gathered. And I found this to be very interesting, Jerry, in comparison with what you were just talking about earlier. You, were, you said it in jest, but you said you believed in flat earth for four years until you turned five. And then right. commentary on that, supporting commentary was children tend to believe what they see. Exactly. So here's a, a method of thought that, that the flat earthers rely upon called the Zetetic Method that generally relies upon sensory observation as the dominant means in which their data is gathered. And I found that just to be fascinating when I put it together with what you were saying. So It's a huge part of what they believe. It's almost like their mind can't wrap around the enormous size that scientists explain the earth and the fact of, of how it works. And they simply go back to that of a small child and say, well, everything that I look at and see is flat. Therefore, it must be flat. Yep. The one argument that they have that um, always kind of gets me is the water or argument. Um, and from and I think that that is one of the things that if you just look at it at the very surface, having no understanding of physics or the way the planet works or the way a globe works, and you don't. If you just take it at face value, it makes perfect sense. It if you is. pour water in a cup, mm. it takes the shape of the cup. <laughs> if you pour water on the table, it falls off the table. <clears throat> so on its surface... <laughs> Wait a minute. So explain the theory you're referring to. First. What? What is the theory that you're referring to? What Clay was talking about. That all we, we live on a flat plane that is surrounded by a 150-mile... Or a 1.5 mile tall wall 150 of ice. 150 foot. 150 foot, whatever. Yeah. Wall of ice all the way around us. And which that, holds the oceans in. Which holds the oceans in. It, the water now gets flat and is basically on a cup. It, we, we're on a big pond. We're all on islands inside a big pond, basically. So on the surface, that makes great sense. And I think that that could be the nugget of truth that so many people who believe in the flat earth cling to. This guy, and I'm sure you guys have seen him on, doing any research at all on flat earth, Caleb Fay is got to be the weirdest <laughs> one individual on the flat earth movement. But he's everywhere with these videos. And he probably single-handedly has swelled the ranks of the Flat Earth movement just because he's everywhere. And I'm talking about the blonde guy with the blue eyes. Yeah. Creepy to look at, even creepier to talk, and <laughs> often proves himself wrong. <laughs> but it's funny, Stephen, that you mentioned that because even in some of the um, some of the arguments that I was reading that were put together – by true believers of the flat earth theory. 
even within the context of their own writings, I was finding contradictions. Um, and, and again, that's to me, it kind of also kind of backs up what Jerry's saying when these people just kind of fall back on their baser instincts instead of using critical thinking skills to approach a subject. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen just a lot of contradictory material in some of their own most profound writings. Clay, by any chance, did, have you seen the movie called Behind the Curve? I have not. It is a, uh, originally it was sponsored by Netflix. It's a documentary that came out in 2018. Uh, and I thought they did a really good job of doing what you said that you attempted to do at the very beginning of this. And that's to come into it with an open mind. And the, the filmmakers did an excellent job of allowing both sides to tell their story. I didn't walk away feeling that the producers of the movie was trying to force you into one belief or the other. Mm-hmm. In the movie, they uh, there was several different groups that they talked to, several different groups that they followed, and uh, a couple of those groups were doing experiments to attempt to prove that the world was flat. Mm. And in one of them, a gentleman by the name of Bob Canodal, uh, they him and his group had purchased a twenty thousand dollar laser gyroscope. And this laser gyroscope was an attempt to prove that the Earth doesn't rotate. Uh, as the <laughs> Earth rotates, if it does, if you believe that the Earth is round and it's rotating, which they don't. They, they believe that the Earth is stationary and that it, the, everything, including the sun, revolves around it. But if the Earth does rotate, the laser gyroscope, a $20,000 one that they, and this is according to them, that they bought a $20,000 laser gyroscope, it should be able to pick that up. Mm. And when they begin to run their experiments, Nodal explains, he said, and I quote, we picked up a drift. In fact, it was a 15 degree per hour drift, end quote. So 15 degrees an hour, multiply that by 24 hours in the day, and you've got 360 degrees. Yeah. You got it. Their experiment would prove one complete rotation of a spherical object within a 24 hour period. Now, that would stop most mere mortals, right? Right. <laughs> no. The next word out of his mouth is, and I quote, now, obviously, we were taken aback by that. Wow, that's kind of a problem. No. We, we obviously were not going to accept that. And so we started looking for ways to disprove it was actually registering the motion of the earth. His experiment proved the exact opposite. <laughs> his experiment proved that the world is a sphere and does rotate. They didn't spend two seconds considering the fact that it's a possibility. Immediately had to say, well, we can't accept that. Yep. So where do we go from here? That, so that, I want to just take a quick. With the, the contradictions is another thing that I found just prevalent throughout all, yes, of, all of this material. It is. I will say, Clay, so. Jerry, when Clay and I were talking about getting him back on the show, he I was kind of nudging him for a topic that he wanted to talk right. about. He sent the three topics. And I wanted to congratulate you, Clay. You have been more success, successful with this topic of sending Jerry down a rabbit hole than I have in two years of doing this podcast. Well, <laughs> he spent more time on this one than he has on any other podcast. I told How many Steve hours, Jerry? Earlier today, I said, uh, he's always telling me about going down rabbit holes and I should try to look for some to, to go down myself. And I said, I, I actually did that this week, sort of. And it wasn't in the idea that I was finding things that made me believe it was true. It was just going from one huge thing to another thinking, why don't they consider this? Well, how about this? One? <laughs> and several times, like the one that I just mentioned, it's their own evidence, their own experiments proves otherwise. And, uh, but yeah, I ended up spending probably th around 30 hours this past week uh, researching this. And uh, not that again, that I found anything that was believable. It was just how in the world can you not believe what you've been taught since you were in, in the first grade? I, I'm the earth shocked at all to hear that. And I knew going into this topic that Jerry was going to flourish because one, the one <laughs> thing that Jerry is uh, well many things that jerry i'm sure flourishes at but the one thing that i can 
easily identify as a strong suit that Jerry has is doing critical research that shuts shit down. And, yeah. and Jerry had no shortage of stuff. I know. <laughs> I said, man, once he gets going on this, he's going to find so much material just to say, yes, yeah, bullshit. <laughs> so I, I can just imagine Jerry for the last week just looking at his computer saying, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we pitched him a softball this week, man. <laughs> but at the same time, I agree with what Clay said in the beginning. And it's also something that they make a big deal about in the movie Behind the Curve. They uh, again, it, it's pretty equal with them interviewing flat earthers and people on the opposite. And there, there's a bunch of scientists and two or three of the scientists are saying the same thing that Clay did early. Look, we can come on and say that they're morons. And all that does is drive them further into their corner and make them believe that we're the enemy and right, we can't be trusted. Right. And they won't listen to anything I have to say. He's like, so what? You know, several of them were saying, what I try to do is to listen, to, to, to figure out what. Where are they coming from? What made them originally gravitate toward this and try to work from there to get them back? Uh, so from, most- from that aspect, Jerry, what is one of the things that we talked about earlier that one of the experiments that they used and how they, they with the water and the, oh. um, the refraction, uh, tell, us, tell us how that works and how, from a very cursory uh, test, it makes sense. Oh, yeah, well, the world's flat, but one step further in the research shows, well, you're wrong. Clay, have you ever heard of the Bedford level experiment? Jerry, it sounds familiar to me, <sighs> but uh, give, me, give, me a, give me a couple of uh, memory joggers. Okay. The idea is with the curvature of the Earth, Science says that the Earth has to curve approximately eight inches for every mile. It's 7.87, but it's approximately eight oh, inches, yeah. which means if you're just, you know, a four-year-old kid, as I mentioned earlier that I was looking out, everything appears flat. If you are close to a large body of water, by large body, I mean, you can see a few miles. And obviously, we know that water is going to be flat, right? It's going to go to its lowest point. So if you're looking at a flat body of water over a long distance, several miles, you should be able to begin to see the curvature of the Earth. Back in the 1800s, uh, the Bedford level experiments were conducted. There's a six mile length of the old Bedford River uh, where it's a six mile straight stretch. And Samuel Burley Rothbottom was conducting experiments, and he started in 1838. And what he was seeing was that if he was to take uh, right above the surface of the water, a few inches above the surface of the water, he was to look down the entire six-mile stretch that he could see the end of that stretch. And to his eye, there was no visible curvature. There was nothing disappearing. In other words, a foot tall object, if you put a boat one foot tall at the end of the six mile stretch with a good enough pair of uh, a telescope, you can see it. Now, the eight inch drop per mile for six miles, six times eight is 48, so it'd be 48 inch drop. All of this is possible due to something called atmospheric. Refraction. One second. Help me up, trying to scroll down to it. Atmospheric refraction is what makes this possible. It's due to the different density mm. of the water because the density of the air in the Earth's atmosphere decreases with heights above the Earth's surface. Uh, all of that goes away if you were to do the exact same experiment, only raise it up 10 or 12 feet above the water. But anyway, it's things like this that uh, initially when this gentleman did his research, Mr. Rothbottom, mm. Uh, it convinced a lot of people, hey, maybe the Earth is flat. It wasn't but a few years later until several surveyors uh, proved him wrong. They actually made a bet, uh, and he lost the bet, and he contested and took it to court, and, yeah, it was that serious. Oh, wow. Yeah. but And you can go to uh, wikipedia.com and under if you just research Bedford-level experiment and read all about it. But, yeah, there there is certain things that make people go, hmm, 
it's easy to understand what he was doing. He was slightly above a body of water looking at a great distance. And he said, I can see for six miles and there is no curvature. Yeah. Now, to explain how that's happening and you start getting into atmospheric refraction is complicated. It's it's not something that the average person's ever heard of, much less can begin to understand. Right. We're not going to cover it here because, I, yeah, I fall into that category. <laughs> very, very that's what most people technical uh, uh, thing. It is. It point. is. Uh, I, I came but, across oh, go ahead, Clay. a little bit of evidence along those same lines that that does support yeah i guess it was maybe a way that they did prove curvature <clears throat> but a lot of times if you if you will watch a boat off in the distance on the horizon of of the water you'll exactly. notice that the back of the boat does disappear but what is still visible is the very tall mast that's in the center of the boat and as the boat does Travel exactly. and go along the curvature of the earth as it's actually descending down that curvature. That is the only time that you will actually see the mast start to disappear. And that in and of itself indicates that there is a curvature. 100%. And I, you don't need to be a physicist. You don't need to be great at math. That's simple. Stand at a shoreline and watch a boat as it disappears into the distance. And Clay's 100% right. That well, simple experiment proves the curvature. Well, there. I'm going to give you a simple experiment that doesn't prove flat Earth also. <laughs> okay. So one of the simple experiments that you can watch on TikTok all day long or on Reels or whatever Which you get. We all know Steve loves to do. Yeah, TikTok is his yeah, favorite. It's just what I got all, the, all kinds of time in the world for is to go on a plane, on a long plane ride, and put a level on the plane and notice that the tip of the nose of the plane isn't always curved as it goes around the earth. Yep. Yeah. Having seen those videos and seen the people Are you guys there? Oh, there? There you are. A couple of the, what I is lost, it? Did yeah, I lost you? you for a minute, but it sounds like you're back. Oh, okay, cool. Good. I'm sorry oh, about no that. No worries. Uh, oh, yeah, that's why. Wow. Interesting. Well, it's... Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to get all upset. I was reading what the computer was telling me. It was jacked okay. up. Um, so Mike says, and, and he's like, <laughs> he's like, well, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know the technical terms of it. But basically, if you're flying west toward the sun and the sun is setting, it doesn't just fall off and go away. If you're flying in that general direction, you're chasing the sun, basically. As it goes around the earth, so are you. Um, and the same way with the moon on the other side, so or the, the the sunrise on the other side. It would also be true in the exact opposite if you're headed east. Correct. The sun would disappear much, much quicker because you're running away from it. Yep. Right. No, and he says that uh, he has um, no doubt that we live on a globe. <laughs> <laughs> and he went into technical reasons, you know, and I've flown. I understand the reasons he says. You know, one of the big things flat earthers will say is, well, we have to fly over Iceland to get to England. That means we're on a flat earth. No, that's a safety feature that they don't want jets just flying across the pond if they can keep from it. They want them to be within a landing distance in case there's an emergency. So um, that's just one thing of the, the many. <laughs> Here's a question. How long have we known? How long have scientists, educated people, known that the Earth was a sphere? Well, this is not something, according to Flat Earth, Galileo, they make it. No, we go, guys, we go back way farther than that. The ancient Greeks deciphered the Earth's shape and circumference in the third century BC. And and they did it, oh, wow. and they did it with no fancier tools than a stick and the light of the sun. Uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, 
see if I can get this right. It wasn't uh, Aristotle or Plato. Yeah, I Arist- think of Eratosthenes was his name. Was a- he? Say that a- three times fast. <laughs> he was able. He was a philosopher in Greece, and he was able to calculate <clears throat> at that time that the planet's circumference was between 24,000 and 29,000 miles. Well, in actuality, it's 24,900 miles. So it was in very the close. Third, Damn, third, 240 third. years B.C. A guy with a stick and some sunlight and <laughs> that the earth was rotund. <laughs> Can you imagine if you were the one that had to tell that guy? Guess what the future holds. Guess what we're going to be debating 2,300, 400 years from now. Would blow here's, his mind. Here's, here's what I don't know. Here's what I don't know. I know. I don't know how, you know, I like to watch Tyson Neil deGrasse. I think he's a brilliant man. He's, he's one of the people who is Very a smart. scientist, but also has the ability to put a lot of science in plain English in very plain English. I like that. Oh, yeah. And but he talks about things sometimes that just absolutely blows my mind in the mind of physics. I'm not a phys- a physics person. I, I'm obviously I don't do that for a living. I'm not a scientist. Um but I'm smart enough to understand when a scientist is speaking most of the time and all the imperial evidence backs what he's saying up, then I'm going to probably trust in what he says. Now, in a lot of cases where scientists, in order to get funding, have made different statements that probably, and that's cost us, and that's a beginning, I think, of where some of this comes from. Back but, to what Clay was saying, right? Same deal with yeah. governments. But do you know what hasn't happened? The entire scientific community has never fudged the facts on one thing right? For over and over and over. And you have to believe that that's exactly what's happening if you believe in flat earth, that all the scientists in the world are lying yeah. to you. And that yeah. all the that, world that, governments are like Japan, Russia, China, and the United States. <laughs> Are Everyone. all colluding together to hoax these f- uh, photographs that are supposedly fake? Well, the Russians and the Chinese and the Japanese have all put up as many Earth from space photos as NASA. Sure, sure. And you know, when NASA comes out and says, "Hey, most of the planet, you know, most of the video you see of Earth spinning around, we have created that." That that tends to the the conspiracy theory minded person takes that and runs with it, um, and, and I kind of get that. But sometimes you have to make a collage when something is so big, and you can only take a picture that is so of a certain amount of it. But there's a difference between what you just said is, and NASA said this several times. They will release a picture that's a. 240 degree angle. They have right. no camera that can do that. So what they right. have done is to take four or five different pictures to put them together into a collage. But you have to believe that 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 they lied about everything. Right. When they tell you we took these pictures and all we did was move so many degrees and took another one and put them together, you have to believe that that's all a lie. Well, they have to believe that the iPhone doesn't exist with a panoramic camera because that's what a panoramic camera does exactly. on an iPhone. It just sure. takes a very large series of very small pictures. It puts them together. Here's a few things that I put together a little bit of list that if flat earth is real, we would have to no longer believe these things. No moon landing didn't happen. No Voyager spacecraft. The furthest things from earth that humans have ever created. No Mars rovers, which we get pictures from every other day. No satellites whatsoever. Everything that happens, happens from Earth. Um, And you have to believe that we are on a disk in an entire universe full of globes. We have proven that the other planets are globes. No, no, not according to them, we haven't. Well, I... They don't believe that either. Part of them. Again, there's no one group that says this is what we believe. There's many different variants, but I've seen many of them. Uh, and one of them uses a demonstration, and it uses 
four or five, what looks like a ball, a picture, and they say, are these globe spheres? And if you say yes, he actually reaches up, takes one, and shows that it's a half a ball. Right. He takes the next one and shows that it's a flat disc. So, no, they don't believe that. No, that's They crazy. don't believe that either. There is one thing, Clay, that if we did live on flat earth, that I could really get behind. And we'll burn Jerry's business. What's that, Stephen? If we lived on a flat earth, which this almost makes me want to believe it, okay? That global warming couldn't be possible if there's no <laughs> globe. <laughs> Tell them why that you that makes you almost want to believe in it. Steve was the biggest anti-believer in global warming for so many years. Man-made global warming. There's a difference. Okay. Well, (laughs) scientists say that, you know, we're man is the primary cause of it. Yeah, never mind all of the, you know, volcanoes and all that stuff. What else you got? Oh no, that was it. You mentioned two good ones. Well, you mentioned satellites. Clay mentioned a huge one earlier. Gravity. We get, we have to quit believing in gravity. Yeah. If yeah. Flat Earthers are mm-hmm. true. Does that mean we can just start floating around if we don't believe in it? Oh, because there, well, I've got there's dark matter. You. Remember, it's what. Oh, that's it's right. It's pushing matter. the big terrestrial pancake upwards. <laughs> upwards toward what? That's my next question. With that, the atom is falling. Oh. They say the atom isn't falling. They say when you take an atom and you drop it, gravity is pulling it down. The earth is rushing up no, to no. it. That's what I'm saying. Where are we rushing up to as the earth? Where are we going? Space and beyond. If a scientist <laughs> tells me, oh, go ahead, Clay. I'm sorry. I didn't oh, all right. You me. said where we're going. I said to the top, baby. What top? The very <laughs> <There you go. laughs> rock and roll. <laughs> all the way up. <laughs> Here's a few other things that we have to <laughs> believe is not possible. Sorry. That was a good play. <laughs> Eclipses right. are possible right. with their model. Their model says that we live on a flat earth. There's a dome. The sun is on one side. The, the, the moon is on the other. So the moon could never come between the sun and the earth. Think about a lunar eclipse. The lunar eclipse is when the Earth comes between the moon and the sun. That would require the moon to be underneath. Again, impossible according to their beliefs. No eclipses are possible. Hey, does Nikki listen to the show? No. Oh, that sucks. I've got a great... See, here's the thing I was going to say. Okay, he's talking about my daughter. Yeah. But no, she usually does not. Two young kids. Well, I was just going to throw out the fact that it was great that the moon got a ring around it before any cowboys did. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. You'd have a hard time that using that argument with Nikki. I'll I'll argue it for her. Your team is who? And how many titles do they have? Cowboys have several titles. So unless you're a Pittsburgh fan or a New England fan, you're going to have a hard time with that one against her. Anyway, no. eclipses can't happen. Couldn't happen. Seasons can't happen. They try to explain it. They have a model that they put out, which doesn't go along with any other model that they have, but it shows these concentric rings, and it says, well, as the sun moves around this ring, it's it's the inner ring, then it's wintertime. It shows another one, and that's spring and our fall. It shows yet another one, which is uh, summer. Well, first of all, these rings are greatly different sizes because they're outside each other, which would mean one of two things, either that the sun traveled the same speed and, in other words, took far longer to get around the outside Mm -hmm. ring, which would mean that summer would take a lot longer to happen than winter. That isn't the case. The other possibility is is that the sun would move at greater speeds on the outside one, in other words, to be able to complete that huge circle at the same speed as the inner circle. That would require the sun to be moving at a much faster speed, which would mean that during summertime, that your days would pass much faster if the sun was moving at a much greater speed. Okay. Their model can't even explain seasons. Here's my question, guys. Sure. You guys are both pretty pretty darn smart fellows. So what about the flat earthers that, that bring up the four corners of the earth and the firmament? 
from the Bible? It, there's more than just the, the four corners because they don't believe in a square, right? As Christ right. said, most of the it's vast a, majority of them believe a, that it's a disc. Right. But yet there, there's one of the earliest beliefs in this, I would say, was probably religious. Would you agree? Yes. And and I'm glad we got to this because that was one of the final things I kind of wanted to touch on uh, as far as what, what the true believers really believe. And I'm glad we kind of landed on this. I'm going to, I'm going to say what I have to say and I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, There are a number of biblical references, uh, both canonical and apocryphal that can be interpreted to support flat earth theory. Many proponents of flat earth theory often point to specific passages, uh, especially in the apocryphal texts of the book of Enoch, which uh, appear to cosmologically support the basic tenets of and the basic foundations of their beliefs. Yes, hey, Clay, real quick, I just want to throw out a shout out to uh, one of our listeners, Melody, who sent over a really awesome link to a a part of the book Enoch, which is one of the reasons I brought this up. So shout out to you, Melody. Thanks for that. We love when our listeners like to well, add and, to the and, show. And uh, admittedly, there are some some passages in there that that will open some eyes and, and make you consider some things. It made there were some things that I had to stop and pause. Uh, but conversely There are also a number of passages in those very same texts that, again, contradict flat earth theory Um, for for practical time purposes and to keep the show moving forward. That's really all I want to say about the biblical implications of this issue. There's so many ways to interpret these things and so many different viewpoints that I fear if we get lost in the minutia of a comparative scripture wormhole, which I most assuredly believe the listeners to be quite well equipped to make that adventure on their own, uh, I'm afraid we're going to get lost and never get back on track. So do you guys... Before we move on from that, do you guys have anything more about like Bible stuff or Enoch or maybe even any other stuff that flat earthers believe? I mean, is there anything that I've missed in that regard? Well, nothing you missed at all, but I would add this in reference to the Bible. And there, by the way, Steve, you mentioned the four corners of the earth. That's mentioned four times in the Bible. Uh, there's another phrase, the ends yeah. of the earth that is mentioned numerous times in the Bible. Uh, That's the one that they quote most often. One thing to remember, especially with the ends of the earth, is that in almost half of the usages of this phrase, it isn't referring to land. It is referring to the people that inhabit that. Good point. So according to them, according to flat earthers, there are no people on the ends of the earth. (laughs) So obviously it is a metaphor. It, it is not something that is to be taken literal. It's the Bible talking about far distant reaches of the earth, not the actual ends of the earth. Right. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't be groups of people living there. Uh, and, and yes, as Clay mentioned, a couple of examples, it talks about the circle of the earth and uh, would, would lead the opposite way. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, and Job 26, yes. 10. Uh, look either one of those up. Also, when it comes to metaphors, keep in mind that Jesus referred to himself. Here's a few things that he called himself in the Bible. Bread, manna from heaven, a shepherd, a light, a vine. There's no one that I've ever heard of that's religious that believes that Jesus is a little vine. A <laughs> that he vine. was a plant. <laughs> that he was a plant. These are all metaphors. So you've you got to believe my, in, uh, in metaphors. people out there. Sorry. Exactly. You've got to believe in metaphors <laughs> when, you, when you're reading uh, these well, other things. So keep that in mind. And suddenly these verses in the Bible are so well, much I think it, to I think that it, it's one of those situations, as is so much the case, where people will pick out what they want to believe, sure. blend that, bend that, how they need it to, to be, to feel it. And I'm not just talking about flat earthers. When we're talking about the Bible in specific, people have done that for dec- for for hundreds of years to gain power from it. So, sorry, that's, two, that's two real quick asides that. on the the 
biblical thing. Sure. Uh, just a note on the book of Enoch. Um, a lot of the references that flat earthers rely upon are found in um, book two of the book of Enoch. Um, there were approximately one to two centuries that passed between the writing of book one and book two. And there's some conjecture as to whether Enoch was really even the author of book two. So I'll just put that out there. Also, let's keep in mind that the <clears throat> biblical references that Jerry was talking about just a moment ago about the ends of the earth and the four corners, we're also talking about a period in civilization where our understanding and knowledge of the size, breadth, and scope of the actual earth was pretty limited. Um, exploration, as we understand it, had not taken place, and it probably was a much smaller world to them at that time. So the point wor yeah. worth making. Absolutely. So let's, to put a kibosh on this, Jerry, uh, let's do our thumbs up. Or th is, is, oh. Can I tell one story before? Oh, we please get do. There? And this is one that I showed you earlier. Um, I'm going to read something and try to describe the picture that went along with it. Okay. The quote was this. Usually the solid rock of the flat earth uh -oh. prevents transition to the other side. But sometimes an asteroid collision calls a hole to open up. This happened 66 million years ago. End quote. In case you're wondering, I'm still in the middle of the quote. This is not what I believe. This is a quote. So <laughs> back to the quote. Dinosaur leaders convinced their followers that there was a better world on the other side after this asteroid hit it and drove the hole through it. So dinosaur leaders convinced their followers that there was a better world on the other side. That's why the dinosaurs went extinct, because all of them went through the hole. When they got to the other side, they all fell off. Only the birds were able to survive because they flew back. <laughs> please, please, please go ahead and give credit to the person who wrote this. <laughs> I will. Also, I'm not going to dog them like that. I'll give a link to it. We, we'll put the picture up All along right. with the, the quote. Uh, <laughs> the guy has a picture of a flat earth with an asteroid hitting it and driving a hole through it. And this is his explanation of how dinosaurs, which, which again, most of them don't even believe that dinosaurs existed. But this guy is trying to explain how they did exist and how they went extinct. Unbelievable. So, yeah, yeah, pretty much bad. so. So, uh, you were get to get back yes. to what you were asking. Jerry, thumbs, thumbs up, up or, thumbs, or down. thumbs down? More <coughs> needed, more information needed, or no? No, I think uh, that last one would. If any more information was needed, <laughs> the asteroid that hit the Earth and drove the hole through it, and dinosaurs <sighs> went through and fell off the other side. That reminds I think me that that, that, ends it. that reminds me of the congressman that on in yes, a session yes. of Congress. Said if we overloaded one side of the island, we would not <laughs> fall in the ocean. Yes. The admiral's face during that procedure, how he held it together, I had no idea. And Kudos for those wondering, real. that actually happened. The it's a true story. Yeah. In Congress, was talking to an admiral and was asking if we put too much hard talking about Guam on one side of an island, Guam, would it flip over? <laughs> yes, Clay Davis. Thumbs up or thumbs down on whether the flat earth theory Need needs more, more or less coverage. Gentlemen, in conclusion, I have to say that flat earth theory seems to be rooted in an overwhelmingly large distrust of authority and institutions. And I think that, as mentioned before, this may be indicative of a larger, more overarching issue in society. On the surface, it would be very easy to dismiss flat earthers as moronic and misguided, but there's a genuine sincerity in what these folks believe. They aren't just trying to troll us. These folks legitimately believe in flat earth theory. And though I struggle to take this topic on with any degree of seriousness, I am fascinated in what makes the true believers cling to this theory uh, with the, the the fervor and zeal that they demonstrate. Uh, perhaps 
Perhaps the overload of information, both reliable and unreliable on social media has created an environment where it is difficult for those who have like a deficiency in critical thinking skills to differentiate trustworthy information from garbage. These folks literally view the stuff that's on YouTube as their sacred texts. I mean, seriously, guys, the, 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 the YouTube videos about flat earth are considered to be sacred texts to these people. Um, Ooh, it really is. I agree. Uh, there's an interesting quote before I give this thing a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, there's a guy named Les McIntyre who works at Boston University, and he does a lot of studies on people that that go against science. And, and his quote was that flat earthers seem to have a very low standard of evidence for what they want to believe but an impossibly high standard of evidence for what they don't yes. want to believe. And I think that's very true. Yes. Much of the power of conspiracy theories such as flat earth is derived from vagueness, vagueness in what they present uh, as an alternative theory about an important issue or an event. But in the long run, they build a vague explanation as to why some authorities or institutions are concealing the truth. Um, to me, I have to, I want to give it a thumbs down, but unfortunately I know it's not going away anytime soon. It way fast enough <laughs> for me. I, I've gotten to the point where I've eliminated most of the flat earthers that are on my Facebook feed. There might be a couple that are still lingering and I've got a weed too, but I'm serious <laughs> guys. This can't go away fast enough. Thumbs down. But I, I know it's coming back. <laughs> I agree. Whether well, it's deserved or not. I uh, I also, I think I'm going to join you two in the thumbs down. Um, not for anything nearly as intricate other than the fact that I am a huge space guy. And if you're telling me that space can't be attained, then I don't want any part of it. <laughs> That's all I got. I also have one last question. Sure. If the Earth was really flat, wouldn't cats have pushed everything off the Earth? <laughs> oh my I'm just saying. Oh, my goodness. Clay Davis, when are you coming back Anytime to see us, man? If you want, man, we'll, uh, we'll do it. I, I love this. I love welcome. you guys, and uh, anything I can do to help you guys out. Uh, hopefully, 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 I gain you listeners you? instead of running off. This may be oh, the exception tonight. <laughs> hey, you gave us three great topics, and at least one of them I'd already brought up to Jerry, and he's like, uh, "The JFK, I think, would be a very, very interesting topic. It's so it, huge, it, yeah." It was I mean, a if fun one, and it, ten... it, would, it would be a lot to take on, just like the UFO thing, just because there's similarly uh, as many questions yeah. that open up as there are answers. I guarantee well, I guys, here's the thing. If you don't get it started, you can't get it done. If you guys ever want to do the Oklahoma bombings, I promise you I can make that one real interesting because there's, stuff, there's so much that. stuff about that that never came to the surface. So, and then. Oh my gosh, I've done a little bit of research on that myself, and you're right. You're 100 percent right. It's did we talk about the flat earthers not buying into or having a mistrust of scientists? When you start digging into Oklahoma City, you very quickly, if you don't already, you you learn to have a huge mistrust Absolutely. in our government. But let's not. So, Let's not limit our well, guys. We appreciate to you tonight. Topics. If there's anything at all, y'all guys ever want to talk about, I'm a phone call away, guys. Awesome. Well, we have to be careful because you go to work really early today. This week that, you happen to be on vacation, so that worked out. Well, 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 we're always willing to make <laughs> certain concessions for you guys, man. <laughs> oh, big hearts! So all right, guys. Well, we appreciate you. Stick around for an awesome bonus story. Thanks, guys. Thanks See you, Clay. Man, that episode is really interesting.
And if you'll stick around for us for just a few commercials, we have another great story to tell you. Hi, this is Ed Lock with USA Mortgage. When it comes to buying a home, the process can be overwhelming and confusing. With so many options, it can be hard to know where to start. That's why it's important to work with a certified mortgage loan originator. I have the knowledge and expertise to guide you through the process and find the best mortgage option for you. I will work with you every step of the way to ensure that you are getting the best deal possible. So if you're looking to purchase or refinance, please reach out to me at 502-680-0953. So don't take on the stress of buying a home alone. Work with me and I will make your dream a reality. Trust the professionals and make your home buying experience a positive one. MLS ID 448-908, DAS Acquisition Company, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, MLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is equal housing opportunity. If you want us to review or rate your product on air, if you have suggestions for new episodes, awesome ghost stories, or anything else, please reach out to us. Our email address is newsworthywithstephenjerry at gmail.com. Our text number is area code 540-709-1318. And now, back to the story. So, the bonus story tonight, Jerry, in, in our podcast, a lot of times we talk about the very dredges of society. Right. The mass murderers, the most evil, the, the, the most horrid people you can imagine. Sure. However... In the bonus story tonight, I wanted to talk about the other side of the spectrum. In particular, I want to talk about the accident when the Titanic hit the iceberg. Okay. When the Titanic sank, it carried millionaire John Jacob Astor V. The money in his bank account was enough to build 30 Titanics. However, faced with mortal danger... He gave up his spot for on the lifeboat to save two frightened children. Millionaire Isidore Strauss, co-owner of the largest American chain of department stores, Macy's, was also on the Titanic. He even said, and I quote, I will never enter a lifeboat before another man. His wife, Ida Strauss, also refused to board the lifeboat, giving her new spot, her, or giving her spot to their very new um, appointed mate, uh, Ellen Bird. She decided to spend the last moments with her husband as the, the boat sank. These wealthy individuals who combined had more money than half of the states in the Union, <laughs> uh, preferred to part with their wealth and even their lives rather than compromise their moral principles. Their choice in favor of morale highlights the brilliance of human civilization and human nature. I thought that was pretty awesome. Absolutely. Kudos to them. Very admirable. And Jerry, if you can't see the light, be the light. 